And so then, welcome back, everybody. It is time now for our panel discussion, one that I have been much, very, very much looking forward to. This panel is moderated by Dr. John Delaney and is going to be um, about, well, just all the other things that you can do with art, cultural and historical applications with spectral data. And so Dr. Delaney is a senior imaging scientist and supervisor of the chemical imaging lab in the scientific research department of the conservation division of the National Gallery of Art. His research focuses on the development of remote sensing sensors and processing methods for the study of paintings and works on paper. He received his PhD from the Rockefeller University and has published more than 100 papers in the areas of imaging and spectroscopy. All right, John, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, today, uh, our panel will focus on um, what we call imaging spectroscopy or multispectral hyperspectral imaging uh, spectroscopy of paintings, uh, works on paper, um, as well as uh, looking for text as well as identifying pigments. So I'm here today with uh, Roger uh, Easton, who's a professor at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, Fenella, uh, France, um, who is the head of uh, conservation science at the Library of Congress, and uh, Francesca Gambrelli, who is an imaging scientist at the Rijksmuseum. I think we're going to start off by going through a series of slides that the, speak, the speakers have put together to give you an idea of what we are, have been looking at. So let me share my screen. Okay, and for now, I'll let you start. John, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with my colleagues and uh, as you'll see, uh, such fun topics. So as John was saying, uh, with spectral imaging, I'm just using it as a generic catch-all, we're looking at a lot of different components, particularly in terms of cultural heritage. What's the condition of that? Uh, can we assess some preservation issues? Can we find information that's hidden or obscured? And what's the provenance of that object so that we can actually add value to our collections and link different collection components together? And as John said, I'm using spectral in terms of multi, hyper, um, as other components. Next, please. There we go. Wonderful. So one of the really fantastic things using Envy is, uh, but particularly with a, what, a lot of what we do is not just reflected imaging, but we also do a number of different imaging modalities. So we have raking or side lighting, uh, we have transmitted imaging that images through, and we have fluorescence imaging, which captures various components in terms of pigments. When we put these all together into one huge data cube, we've got an awful lot of information and the, the various tools we had through Envy really help us with that. And as I wanted just to focus on, we can capture once and process often because we often find that the researchers that we're working with suddenly come back when we find something and say, well, that's interesting. Can you, can you tell us more about that? And so we can answer different questions with that combination of modalities. Next, please. An example here of a recent work we looked at, which was the 1300 Magna Carta uh, that had been on exhibit in Washington, DC. So you can see there, there's some serious areas of loss. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with uh, other techniques to actually understand what that is. That big, large stain is uh, very likely rodent urine. And we can now image through that and bring out the original trends uh, information from 1300, which was around when Edward reissued this and a lot of the historians are curious to see what some of the reissued text was. Next, please. One of the other aspects of this, as well as the damaged component, is how things are created. Uh, so what you're seeing here is different versions and what we're looking at, uh, and next please, is we can see on the, the left there, a line, next please. And what we actually have is the spine of the animal that the parchment was made from. So this is really some of those scrapings we're really trying to understand as part of a collaboration with uh, colleagues in Ireland, how these parchment 
sheets were made. And one other example we had was where you could start to see the veins still there. We knew that the person who'd created that parchment was not very expert because they didn't actually do that properly before they actually created the parchment. So we'd starting to learn historically a lot about how these materials are made. Next, please. One of the very interesting things uh, as part of understanding is how we build up historic recipes. As you'll hear from my colleagues, pigments are not simple. And so a lot of what we need to understand is how those are put together. Uh, next, please. And so one of my, my staff, uh, Cindy here, is making lots of, we, we've made up a huge number of colorant sheets with different dilutions, different binders on different uh, substrates. And now we're building up that spectral library. What's really interesting here is we're comparing the, the multi or hyperspectral with fiber optic reflectance spectroscopy, but the challenge is we want to be able to share that. And this is where I just wanted to note, for us, it's very important that we start to look at fair data principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And being able to capture this data and share it with colleagues internationally is very important because a lot of our cultural heritage is about collaborations. Next, please. What we tend to do is uh, add different data sets together. So the data fusion and what that analytical approach is, is really important. We always start with the mapping of that spectral response. And so that initial capture through the, the spectroscopy is then added on with uh, multiple techniques that essentially build up information as we dig down and understand more, whether it's what the pigment is, whether it's the the organic or the inorganic components, adding to that, even to the profile of materials, yes, we did sniff the Magna Carta to see what it smelled like, because it can tell us a lot about the degradation. Next, please. So what we have is what we turn the go team. Uh, we can take instruments to collection areas and bring all of those techniques together. And as I said, start to fuse different data sets together. Next, please. What's so interesting about that is how do we actually visualize this data? So using the IIIF framework in Mirador, we can give people access to all of the different wave bands of that data set, allow them to start to move materials uh, around and then adding scientific information. And it would be fantastic if there was something like this capability, which would allow us to share the data with different audiences. Thank you, John. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, uh, Fenella. And uh, so that's the work you're doing at the Library of Congress and how you're using spectral imaging there. And we'll go on and uh, Francesca will talk about what's happening on the other side of the pond at the Rice Museum. Yes, thank you, John. Um, it's an honor for me to be here with you guys. Um, so yes, I will go to uh, a totally different um, uh, environment because I am at the Rice Museum right now. And um, uh, what you see on the screen uh, is one of the most um, important uh, objects that we have uh, at the museum. It's um, the Night Watch, painted by Rembrandt. Uh, this painting is huge. Um, it's 3.5 uh, by 4.5 meter. And of course, um, the analysis of this painting is uh, pretty hard. Uh, we couldn't uh, bring this painting to the lab because of its historical importance and also because uh, of its dimension. And we decided to uh, build a glass uh, chamber around the, the painting and actually um, um, study the painting with uh, a lot of different uh, techniques from uh, X-ray to um, reflectance imaging spectroscopy. And um, uh, we also took some micro samples uh, that have to be analyzed. So what you see here highlighted um, is an imaging frame that we had to build around the painting to actually um, allow the cameras to uh, move um, and navigate uh, onto the surface of the painting. So there are two um, uh, y, uh, two poles, vertical poles that allow the Y movement and one horizontal pole that allow the X movement. And you see also a um, in a circle, the uh, platform where the instruments um, were actually mounted together with the lights. Uh, next, please, John. Uh, yes, this is a, a, a zoom in um, to the platform where the instruments were sitting. This is uh, uh, one of the camera that we used. We used a, a Swir camera 
from a head wall company. And here you see it uh, sitting with the two lights on the platform in front of the uh, white spectrum that we used uh, for calibration. And at the same time, we also used a visible camera that was working into the uh, from 400 to 1000 nanometer. This one uh, is working from 900 to 2500 nanometers. And next, John. Because the painting is not flat and uh, it's indeed huge, um, and we know that it's deviating from a plane by, of like three centimeters, um, we needed to create a system to actually um, basically have an auto focusing a focusing system uh, of the camera. So during scanning, uh, we needed to have the cameras to go back and forth. Um, towards and backwards uh, with respect to the painting to keep uh, the, the focus distance because we really wanted to keep the same uh, spatial resolution um, during the scanning of the entire painting. Um, and of course, we, we needed to keep the, um, the cameras in focus. So we uh, pro the, cam the platform was programmed to move um, when the distance, uh, um, the focus distance distance was a little bit out of the, the value of focus. And we could monitor this with the, uh, five lasers that you see here into the uh, photo, uh, thanks John, on the right. Um, we didn't use the, all the five lasers because we didn't need uh, all the five, but we used either two or one for the two, uh, for the two cameras and uh, to keep the same Spatial resolution. This was a challenge during scanning. John knows because he was with, uh, with me when we did that. Um, it was very uh, much a challenge uh, because of, uh, of course, uh, the dimension of the painting and also all the electronic uh, um, that had to be programmed. We had uh, our colleague Rob Erdman that programmed uh, with a code uh, the platform to indeed move uh, during focus, uh, during scanning uh, next John. Uh, so this is just so you know uh, how we planned the scanning and how the scanning happened. Of course, um, when you scan with, with those imaging spectrometer, you, um, uh, you can collect as what we call a swath. Uh, the vertical uh, dimension of this swath is actually the, um, the pixel size of your detector. And then the, um, the horizontal uh, dimension uh, or the length um, can be actually decided. Uh, and we decided to... Um, to scan the, to divide the painting in three columns. And then uh, we had 26 rows for one camera and 41 rows for the other one, uh, depends on the field of view. And of course the overlap that we needed to be um, calculated for both. And next John, we had uh, at the end, um, 780 gigabytes for one camera and 765 for another one. So a lot of data to be analyzed um, at that point with um, uh, some softwares. <laughs> and it was a challenge. Um, these are the challenges that we um, encountered during the analysis of the night watch, which was, uh, first of all, eliminate the, uh, the laser signal that we had. So the laser that was allowing us to keep the cameras in focus needed to be um, subtracted to our data, basically. Then uh, we had a lot of um, electricity instability uh, because the platform was, um, of course, moving around with the camera and the light on top, and there were some electricity stability in the museum. So that was another uh, issue that we had to deal with. Uh, we had, of course, noise, so we had to reduce the noise. We had to find the end members uh, that were actually um, related to the uh, pigments. And we know that Rembrandt used a lot of pigments uh, in mixtures, which is a very big challenge for us in our field to uh, identify a pigment in mixture. And uh, there are a lot of pig that are pigments that are degraded, which is another big uh, challenge for us to identify. And uh, of course, the other challenge was technical because to analyze such a big data set, we needed a big, big computer, very powerful. So that was another challenge. And I just wanted to uh, close uh, up with an example. Next, John. 
Uh, this is one of the figure of um, the night watch is a musketeer loading the gun. And um, on your uh, right, you can see then the members that we found. Um, one is uh, the members related to vermilion, which is a, a mercury sulfide. And the other two are related to an organic lake and an organic lake plus a little bit of vermilion. So the, the mixture that I was talking about. And then if you go forward, John, you can see uh, that we could map those three and members on the surface of the painting through um, a spectral angle mapper algorithm. And uh, that's about um, my work for now. Okay, <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. That's a serious area rate coverage problem. Uh, so were you looking at collecting the entire painting in a few days, a few weeks? Uh, sorry, they didn't mention that. We spent two months collecting, <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of time. And now we'll we'll switch to uh, to Roger um, to talk more about uh, multispectral. Thanks, John. Uh, I just wanted to say to begin, it, it, I was scanning through the list of attendees, and I see several longtime colleagues and several recent colleagues. But even more so than that, I see several former students <laughs> here from Imaging Science at RIT, and I'm going to uh, soothe their. Uh, fears by saying I'm not going to talk about Fourier transforms here. <laughs> um, so what what I've got is I, I picked a single example of some result that we had obtained recently. This is not new data. This is uh, data from 2017 that was collected by Ken Boydston of Megavision uh, for two tiles, two sections on this globe, the so-called Earth Apple at the German National Museum in Nuremberg, and uh, we went back and looked at the data recently and got some new results and I thought they might be of interest. So go on to the next one, John. So this is one section of the interior of Africa. And uh, you can see there's some obvious writing. There's some other writing that's not so obvious, but the thing that surprised us was particularly in the water bodies. So go on to the next one, John. So there's the full-sized image. And you can see one of the difficulties we have simply because it's a globe, uh, the curvature gives us the potential for glints. So that was a problem here. We collected, or I shouldn't say we, cause I wasn't there, but Ken collected 24 bands of data, uh, reflective and fluorescence. And so go on to the next one. This is a result from that 24 bands of data with some pre-processing and this is M and F, minimum noise fraction processing, and this is band 24. So this is way down in the, in the weeds, as we say, way down in the noise. And this was totally unexpected, unanticipated writing in the uh, water bodies. So that was a particular excitement to us. And then the next slide is the next section. So this was uh, another section Ken did down in the South Atlantic. This globe has been studied an awful lot, but uh, we found some new stuff here. So the next slide is a full, a bigger view of that. And you can see the red writing quite obvious. Uh, right there in the center, it, you can see that there's the potential for some, exactly there, there's some other writing. And if we go to the next slide, you'll, the next slide was designed to enhance the visible text. So nothing real exciting there, nothing new. But the following slide is the similar processing, but just using six infrared bands. Uh, and we get a wholly different text. So John, could you step back and forth? Um, yeah, so there's the over text and there's the under text. And uh, so that was a particular excitement to us. Now, I guess I would finish up by saying our task is significantly easier than a lot of the things that Francesca and John and Fenella do. We're not trying to uh, measure material properties or identify materials. We're just trying to make the text readable for scholars. So in, in that sense, we have an easier job, though the scholars are often uh, very particular, very picky about making sure they've got the readings right. So we often have to go back and look at the data many times subsequently. So uh, that just gives you a couple of examples of some of the things that we do. Uh, spend most of my time working on palimpsests, which are erased and overwritten manuscripts. But this is an area that I thought might be of particular interest since it's in part relatively new. 
Okay, well, I'll finish up with what we're doing here at the National Gallery of Art. Uh, we have a series of uh, camera systems, uh, hyperspectral veneer, mostly uh, a combination of things that we've purchased from industry or had modified from companies, and then rework them ourselves. This is our uh, 1,000 to 2,500 nanometer hyperspectral system that we built here. And we also do a lot of elemental mapping um, to, to map, for example, lead and iron um, using X-ray fluorescence. So we have different modalities that we use to try to get at pigment identification and look for changes in the compositions. An example of that is uh, looking for the original uh, forest that we know is there from the X-ray um, of this painting here, The Feast of the Gods, which was started by Bellini. He finished it with just trees against the background. And then later on, another artist added this hillside. And our job in this particular problem was, can you find all the original trees? And here we're making use of a false color image in the sphere. And the ultimate goal was to combine this with other data, such as the X-ray, transmitted infrared, to uh, eventually do a simulation of how the painting would have appeared after Bellini was finished, before that hillside was painted in to give scholars an indication of, of um, what this would appear like and, and why it might have been changed for, uh, to match other paintings in the room. Other things that we're doing is essentially what was mentioned before. We're looking at a lot of paintings, in this case, an illuminated manuscript, and using um, a veneer with a combination of spot x-ray fluorescence and then uh, point XRF that goes out to 2,500 and using uh, NV tools such as the, uh, uh, the wizard to find spectral end members and then make maps. And then once we've done that, we can actually classify this by using the spectral features and other information so we can identify the pigments that are used. And now we're turning the crank and doing this on a whole series of illuminated manuscripts to try to see and learn more about the working properties of a, of a uh, studio that makes these things. We are trying to move beyond the veneer and, and the sphere. Um, this is some work that uh, we did with Francesco and Chu's here. We've extended out to the, what we call the mid IR, the uh, uh, mid wave and long wave. It's a very important fingerprint region for chemists for identifying materials. So we're now trying to look at data cubes that go all the way from the visible all the way out to um, essentially 28 microns. And then when you do that, you can start out, pull out vibrational features that relate, for example, to proteins. We've been talking about binder pigment identification, but we're very interested in the binders that are used the, to, uh, to mix these paints. In this particular case, we had some evidence that the binder used around um, the, uh, the saint here was actually derived from egg yolk. And by using, um, these vibrational features like the CH feature and the SWEAR, but also using the amide features here, Francesco was actually able to show the presence of protein as well. Uh, and we could also look for a, another lipatic component to confirm the presence of egg yolk. So this is kind of cutting edge for us as to moving into the mid IR to do these identifications. So that begins us to the end of our talks. I'd like to now is just switch over and talk, um, uh, kick around a few, a few challenges that we all have and let the panel discuss. We saw some examples of using m and and uh, principal component analysis to try to get at hidden, hidden uh, writing. We use it for drawings. Maybe the panel might talk about other techniques or other tools that they'd like to have. Do you want first? Yeah, so other than using PCA and m &F, Roger, what else? Well, I often with? use, as a first thing, I often use spectral angle mapping. Um, it typically doesn't give me uh, the result that I need, but it shows me where some text is, which allows me to identify regions that I can then use for statistics for subsequent things. Uh, and I, I do that because spectral angle mapping is so fast. I, I often use that. Uh, lately, I've become very fond of M and F, and particularly using large numbers of bands. Um, okay. In the past, I typically didn't do that. I use smaller numbers in PCA. But. So you look. Um, so, you, but you. Do, I mean, you look for 
spectral differences between the bands inside which bands you use in the MNF to go after a feature? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I will oftentimes be able to identify a, a, a region that is the feature I'm after and then the, M, the spectral angle mapping will help me expand that. But pre-processing, getting the images ready are often uh, very useful tools too. One of the things I use a lot, I didn't mention it in the discussion, but I did use it, is what uh, we call blur and divide, where we'll oh, yeah, sure. take, take an image, uh, take the bands, blur them significantly so that the feature of interest is, is attenuated, you know, is virtually not visible, and then divide the, the sharp by the blur and then process that. And that has the effect of removing some of the coarse variations and, and allowing us to see, oftentimes allowing us to see the more subtle variations. It doesn't always work, but yep. when it works, it can be spectacular. So that's analogous to things like the, uh, the dog filter, the different Gaussians. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, those but this is over, typically over a large area. So. Yeah, we've used that, Francesca, in cases when we're looking for hydroxyl bands, right? Yes, I remember you doing that, John, when I was there. Yeah, in it's, cases where we have, as an uh, sort of an alternative to the continuum, where you have a very narrow yeah. vibrational band, but you have a lot of slow variances. Oh, background, yes, indeed. <laughs> so, Fernello, what else have you been using for trying to pull out hidden images or drawing text or, or damage and looking for changes in the materials? Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, it depends very much on the the object. Um, the combination of the trend, you know, we, bringing together the different modalities is really interesting. Um, we're lucky with our system. I mean, I, the registration is a whole other panel discussion, right? But uh, we're very lucky with the system we have that we don't have to register, you know, everything apart from the fluorescence. There's no pixel shift. But the 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 transmitted has been really interesting, uh, particularly when we've had um multiple layers and uh, often in libraries people laminate things uh two or three layers together and so building up the reflected and the transmitted uh, image to actually pull out what's in between without taking it apart virtually um that's that's been really interesting um we've been starting to sort of work between matlab and we use some other uh, programs as well um and as a number of you mentioned that the pre-processing um you know when we're looking at the, the classification of and, and grouping particularly for watermarks we find being able to separate those out um with the pre-processing helps a lot and um yeah it's, it's what I'm particularly interested in at the moment is what I think you'd also mentioned where we're starting to build up and bring together different spectroscopy data sets and and that's really where it gets challenging as you said Francesca in terms of the the size of the data sets and trying to actually manipulate them all mm -hmm. one of the challenges and sort of back to your point John which would be fantastic is often there's so much information we have to crop down to us to a region to really dig in to to look at that and you know it wouldn't be nice if we all had access to supercomputers that we could just throw the entire data at it and play oh right, right. yeah well <laughs> we, we we heavily rely on parallel processing um <laughs> to get around some of those problems any more thoughts on transforms have you done um techniques like uh, uh where you do color separations um independent components I'm thinking along, along those algorithms yeah we've we sort of go back and forth with um I see you know um it's sort of you know you sort of have the flavor of the month it tends to be a lot of my stuff that end up going back to PCA because it's what becomes so natural um right. but but a lot of it is really uh as Roger was saying making sure we don't throw away looking a little at the eigenvalues in terms of which band is contributing best and then really looking through the entire data cube of okay you know what this one way down there has got something that we didn't expect and and using that as you know we do multiple uh, PCA combinations because often that brings up something that we don't expect. Sure so if you're now using PCA signal to noise is a big deal I mean you really have to have very low noise data and of course the challenge that we all have is um, well, when you're doing remote sensing, you have the light you have, 
I mean, you know, you're using usually a solar light. In our case, we're in a laboratory, nothing's moving. We can turn the light out, but unfortunately we're very limited to, to how much light we can use, especially with works on paper. Um, and so uh, are you finding the, uh, the sort of the CCDs, the state-of-the-art CCDs, are you have adequate signal to noise now or are you looking for new, new instruments on the horizon? So we're, we're always looking for new toys, aren't we, all of us? Uh, but yeah, with LEDs and um, with our system, there's built-in redundancy. So the we've done a lot of checks in terms of the amount of light onto the object, and we've been able to actually increase that somewhat with the extra redundancy in the light panels. So while that doesn't give us the same, you know, I'm always jealous of the wonderful specificity you have with every nanometer. We don't have exactly that, but we do have that broader band and um, that generally works pretty well. What, okay. what I do loved also with our system, just because it's really fun, is we can essentially do spectral microscopy because we can get up to 6,000 uh, DPI with the system okay. we've got. And that's yeah. just seriously yeah. fun. I think, I think we tap out at about, at about 500, 600 DPI, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, you're seeing single, single pigment particles. Um, maybe we might talk a little bit about registration ever so briefly. I know that's an entire subject onto itself. Some of these camera systems, the bands are the hyperspectral or by definition registered, but there's always a desire to add other modalities in. Um, we're a bit different than most people because since these paint paints become transparent in the, in the infrareds or some do, it's not equivalent of doing multispectral uh, or hyperspectral imaging in the natural environment where a tree remains the same, although it's contrast flips. Are there particular tools that you favor to try to do registration? And I'm, this is again to the whole panel. Well, I, I guess I could say something because one of the things we are doing more and more of, and uh, Keith Knox, my colleague, who's, who I've been working with since 30 years now, who's on this call, uh, he's been working to try to register different parts of images collected in the same modality okay. that differ simply because of the chromatic variations in the lens. I mean, wow. we have very high quality lens, but even with that, you can get multiple pixel misregistrations in different bands at right. different locations of the image. And the issue there, of course, is figuring out what the transformation has to be because you, you've got the data to work with and really not much else. And we just in the last week did the first attempt to register a full data set, including fluorescence, reflection and transmission and had pretty good luck with it. So, and this is using Keith's own software that he uh, implemented in his package he calls Hoku, which is freely available. Okay, so um, yeah, Francesca and I have been using some tools that were developed uh, here at the National Gallery, um, also point-based uh, using phase, so it's point-to-point so uh, -point correlation methods um, between different modalities, looking at a certain spatial scale, looking for cracks, any sort of texture we can find that would be the same um, in all the bands. But that still, I think, remains a really important challenge. Um, and the tool sets out there are good when you have simple images where the content's always the same. So yeah, good. when you're looking at a palimpsest and, and the, the text is really well erased, the, the problem becomes much more difficult. The image quality is much more important. So you got to yeah. make sure you got high, as you were saying, you got to have high signal to noise and be able to do that registration to get the pixels to line up. In the, um, in the case of uh, the, uh, the Rembrandt painting, um, the Night Watch, there you had a tremendous amount of data to register and put together. So there, a different procedure was written out by your colleague. Yeah, in the case of the night, which we had, um, as you know, John, uh, Rob Erdman, which is our data scientist uh, um, at the Rex Museum, he basically um, first photo, uh, made uh, like a photo um, of the night watch, 20 micron resolution and five micron resolution. And then he uh, registered uh, the X-ray for essence scanning first, and then the wrist, um, both the visible and the near IR. Um, uh, with a basically, he made um, he wrote uh, his own code in Python, um, and he uh, he made um, he created a visualization tool 
mm -hmm. uh, that we can use to basically switch between all the images that are uh, registered onto the visible, um, but it's still not out there. So it's still just something that is uh, for the team, let's say. <laughs> so we're still working on that. Uh, but at the same time, I have uh, colleagues in Delft, uh, Matthias Alfred, that is in Delft, that is also working on some tools to register um, matrix reference and scanning with the visible and the wrist. And that could be um, something that, um, yeah, could be nice for the community uh, to have. That's one of the challenges we have with the different modalities collected with different systems. The XRF, yeah. the elemental scanning system, is a really point raster scan. And of course, yeah. we have the imaging and then two dimensional imaging, the multispectral. Um, Roger, you know, thinking about your classes and your, your students and the type of problems people will solve in remote sensing, you, normally they get around to doing orthorectification. They put all the data sets on an orthorectified space. And I believe that simplifies the, the types of um, degrees of freedom uh, and makes the registration actually easier than dealing with obliquity factors and stuff like that. Can right. you imagine our field ever going in that direction or is that? Well, I, I could, you know, take the example that I was just showing, the globe. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a real problem. And we pro if we hmm. were to go back to image that whole thing, we probably would need a really good idea of what the topography is. And we probably would want to try to do that, do some kind of ortho rectification in some space first. but. Uh, that's that's not something we've typically had to do. Right. Just given the, the the objects we work with are typically fairly flat manuscript. Right. But with this um, with these new uh, very good algorithms based on uh, stereo photography to to actually extract three D information um, of these objects and the fact that it's now in the imaging field uh, for the study of the works of art uh, as well as the you know, uh, more a pattern projection systems and the extra and as well as six would be the laser scanners. This is something we can actually talk about as, as being a, a future goal. And it would, I think, help down the road as other data sets come in. Okay. Um, and then the last area we wanted to talk about was uh, the challenging one of trying to find spectral end members. So we have this tremendous amount of data and we don't have enough graduate students to analyze every spectra in the cube. So we have to find some statistical way of grabbing them. There are many, many algorithms out there. Um, and in our particular case, because of the nonlinear mixing, it is uh, more challenging than the case of the classic linear, where you have a big pixel and you get a little bit of grass and a little bit of, let's say, dirt, and you can linearly unmix the spectra. We have the problem that we have layers of paint or two pigments mixed together. Um, we all have our favorite tricks getting around and dealing with that problem. I'd be curious for you guys to share some suggestions that you found that work that may not be commonly known or, or just work for you, period. <laughs> so as I mentioned, um, John, we sort of went the other way, which is with uh, iron gore link, right? Everyone's like, basically it looks the same, but how do we actually pull out the actual binders and components? So we've been building up this reference library with huge combinations of different binders, different combinations of, you know, you know, as we know, most artists and people just mix pigments together. And that's been really interesting. Uh, we've been doing a lot of cross-reference between the fours, reflectance spectroscopy and the, uh, the multispectral to see what our limits of detection are uh, with the multispectral, which pigments respond better and what sort of percentage characterization we're getting with this with spectral analyst and that's been really interesting sort of going back and forth um, and then refining that to see like for example we some recent um, iron gold links we we're looking at and we finally got the encosto which is the, the bark component uh, as a identifier which was pretty exciting because that meant it wasn't the gall so it was sort of taking the opposite end to you know sort of work backwards to try and build up our reference library Ah, I see. So you're using a reference library technique. Um, I guess in our case, we've been, and Francesca and I have been finding the first derivative has been a very yeah. good way to emphasize the um, spectral features and then using that to do the, uh, well, actually define them. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and we've found like, for example, a good point, like when we did that first derivative, we could separate out between cold and hot extraction for angle lengths, which was pretty cool. That was, sure. we hadn't seen that before. Sure. I think John, the challenge is of, of finding them because I mean, we use spectral hourglass, uh, the function of MV to find them. Uh, but sometimes I also do it manually. So I go around and I find a few and the member. And I think that uh, this is a big challenge for our community that is the finding of end members really. When you have such a big data set and maybe sometimes you have a noise, um, some, some noise in your data set. So you go to the clustering and then the clustering doesn't look like you hope. And <laughs> so, um, yeah. And to your point, Francesca, it's like when they're degraded too, that, that, that they shift spectrally. So we've been doing you know, some aging of the pigments to try and get a feel for which ones change because it can, can dramatically change the spectral yeah. curve. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Another component, another thing that's really helpful is, uh, especially in the derivative for us, has been to only use a portion of the cube that has a spectral feature of interest yeah. Uh, yeah. to try to try to control that. And also to... Um, to look at regions, like to do use masking, to essentially say, I'm only going to handle this one figure or this one area I'm gonna to try to understand. Um, and that, that has played out pretty well. What has not worked for us is using a library to do spectral matching, because mm -hmm. we really can't get, our paint layers are thin enough that you get the contribution from the underlayer. there are other pigments mixed in. So, while you have the spectral features, you can see them, you know, and actually get transition edges and, and vibrational features to identify them. It's not an easy way to get a direct spectral match. We don't have an optically thick sample. Yeah, uh, the thin, the thin washes, like, yeah, a, a real problem. I know people are monitoring our, our meeting. I was curious if there are any questions that had come in. I saw some hands raised. I think maybe Abby or one of the people could let us know. I have some questions actually, if you'd uh, I got a list compiled, so I'll sneak back in here if you'd like. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's see. Here is a question to start off with. Is it possible to identify material of the paint made of not only by the color of the paint? And is this identification right 100% of the time? <laughs> well, what do you think guys? <laughs> So I assume they're talking about like, you know, with, you know, are we talking about an oil? Are we talking about a binder? So in terms of the material itself. So I think, there I are think in terms features. of the pigment, in terms of the pigment. Mm -hmm. So if you have like cobalt blue and Prussian blue and ultramarine, although they're blues and cobalt blue is sort of purpley like ultramarine, they have very, they're uh, very uh, distinctive and different electronic transitions besides the color, which we can use for the identification, I guess. Um, the problem is yellows, I guess oh. we'd all agree, then they don't generally have. So if you have a simple S shape transition, but the first derivative is useful because if it's Gaussian symmetrical, as Francesca showed you, you can say that would be either red lead or vermilion, depending upon where the wavelength mm -hmm. is. But if it's a red lake, we usually see an asymmetric Lorentzian. So are, there are some techniques using the both to, to go beyond just the color to identify. So pretty much there's, there's, there seems to be a spread of different things that make those pigments, but separating that out and actually figuring out what exactly that is, is a very difficult task to do, and especially in yellow. Uh, well, it's hard when you don't have any feature other than just the transition edge. Mm. Uh, yeah. So basically where it just becomes suddenly reflective. Uh, you, can, you can get a couple of pigments that occur at the same wavelength. <laughs> cadmium, you can find a cadmium red, looks just like vermilion. And you wouldn't know it apart, but you could have to require some other information, for example, uh, uh, by doing elemental mapping, uh, elemental analysis. But I would say it's not hopeless. Uh, <laughs> <it's pretty good. laughs> and you can do it with multispectral. I think that's, that's what also has been showed by the colleagues here. You don't have to always have microspectral. You guys are using a lot of the same you know, terms, cadmium, vermilion, for the kind of stuff that you're doing. Is this only based upon art and one specific region or is that sort of international like was everyone using the same kind of pigments all over the world or is it even more complicated than what you guys are talking about here it's more complicated and even to the point where different countries or different 
field use the terminology in a different way. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> so, you know, someone might say it's a green pigment. Someone might say it's copper based. And then John and mm -hmm. I are like, well, is it vertigo or malachite? You know, I mean, so <laughs> there's so many levels there. It's almost like, are we, are we talking the same language? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. It keeps so, us fun. Yeah, it's, it's everything's a new adventure. Definitely. Let's see. And I guess the, the last question, but so how did you find uh, hyperspectral imaging as a tool for your arts and document analysis? Like how, how did you even, how did it get started with what you were doing? Was it already so, there or did you well, it, run I across guess I a would webinar? Say <laughs> it's becoming more and more common. I mean, most, uh, I, I, I think it's fair to say most of us use multispectral for a long time, uh, you know, back, when the first time we really did this seriously was on the Archimedes Palimpsest, which is oldest known copy of the writings of Archimedes, erased and overwritten. And we were just using a, a few bands. That's when we started to do light emitting diodes. But now you're seeing more and more people, I'm thinking of colleagues at the Bodleian at Oxford mm -hmm. who have a in-house hyperspectral and uh, also at, at University of Durham in England, where uh, Andy Beebe's collected a whole bunch of toys to, to do this kind of stuff. And so the, the processing is, is starting to diffuse into those applications much more than they had been. I think, I think for us in the conservation science field, the challenge of identifying materials non-destructively has always been a big passion. The fact that remote sensing um, the use of hyperspectral to develop and to identify minerals. And since a lot of pigments are mineral based, it became pretty logical once we figured out what was going on. Once we saw what NASA was up to, it became very, uh, very attractive all of a sudden. And uh, the key thing is the cost. <laughs> the, the, the most important thing has been the reduction of cost of instruments mm -hmm. and camera systems to a level of getting them in. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's more than, well, more than interested in working with us. I think we'd all find that Everybody in the industry, whether they're doing software or they're building hardware, are more than happy to try something with us, which is great. That is fantastic. It is fun. <laughs> it, it is very fun. This has been a great talk. Um, we, have to, we have to stop. However, I'm sorry. But thank you, all of you, uh, John, Fanella, Francesca, and Roger. This has been an amazing talk. I look forward to seeing what comes of all of this stuff. I really want to try to keep an eye on it more. Um, and so, you know, a little bit back to the housekeeping. Uh, remember, you guys, there were a lot of questions. I could only get about two in there. So feel free to reach out to the people involved, start a conversation using that people tab. Uh, ask them that uh, there was a big question that came in at the end of there. So make sure you uh, ask all those uh, well, when we we'll close this session. Sure. Hmm? We'll do that for sure. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you.